I would like to do something just a, a little bit different, something we've done before. Um, but I, this is one of those one of those messages that has a scripture in it that I think has been um, often misunderstood, in my opinion. It's my opinion. It doesn't mean I'm always right, but it's my opinion. This text has been misunderstood a lot. And so what I'd like to do with it is to take 10 minutes, okay, here in the beginning, just 10 minutes, and, and unpack this scripture a little bit. And then we'll, we're not going to have another uh, coffee break, but we'll have uh, just a little break to kind of clear our heads from that. We'll have some announcements that come up. Um, but I, I do think that there's some background work that needs to happen here. Um, you know, we don't have Wednesday night Bible study, so I, I'd like to take this moment and kind of flush out a scripture a little bit, from at least from my perspective, because it will inform the way we go in the sermon. So, um, Matthew 3, 13 through 17, okay, in this, we will find the next, uh, the next verse that contains the next comment of Jesus. We're in a series on the red letter, uh, the red letter verses of the Bible, which are the words of Jesus, okay? And this is the next one we come to. Uh, we Last week, if you weren't here, we had him at 12 years old, saying, after his parents were looking for him, didn't you know I had to be in my father's house, okay? And we kind of talked about that as parents, if our child was missing, how we would feel, but as they're looking for him, He's looking to connect with his father. He's looking, he's, he knows that who he is and his identity is beyond that. We talked about priorities and identities and how our priorities come from identity. I, I just wanted to kind of fill people in where we are on the series. So this next one is Matthew 3, 13 through 17. And it says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan, to John, to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? Now, we stop right there, okay, and just put a freeze on. You have to understand, in, in the ancient world, um, oftentimes people, if they were making a radical decision, like people that were not part of Judaism at the time, if they came in, they had to be baptized into the body, into that body, okay, into, into the, the tribe of Judah is actually, but I won't go down that road. And you were submerged from head to toe. Okay, and it represented this kind of leaving of the old way and coming to the new. Even in, in um, Israel, as they're going through the Red Sea, we learn in the New Testament that, that it says that they were baptized through the Red Sea, like as an initiation rite. So John has been saying, hey, this one Jesus, he needs to increase and I need to decrease. So you can picture John being a little confused and saying, wait a minute. Usually you're baptized into a rabbi's yoke, which means their way. Their, their understanding of the Old Testament and how they want to live it out. It was called being baptized into a rabbi's yoke, all right? And so you can imagine with all these disciples John has who's baptized into his way, which was one of repentance, that he sees Jesus coming who needs no repentance, and he's saying, wait a minute, you're supposed to increase, I'm supposed to decrease. Why are you asking me to baptize you? You don't get baptized into my yoke my way, my interpretation, my life method, my life application, I should be baptized into your way because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And so you can see why he'd be confused. But Jesus answered him in verse 15, let it be so for now, okay? Let, let it be so now. For thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Remember that. That's what verse I want to come back to in this little... 10 minute study, fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness, and then he consented. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, and remember this part too, and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. Where am I going with this, and why am I bringing this up before the sermon? Listen, all right? I do not believe that Jesus' words here, where he says, I'm going to fulfill all righteousness. Some people take this to mean that Jesus, he didn't really need this, this moment, this baptismal moment. He was just demonstrating for us and modeling what we need to do. 
And so to fulfill righteousness, to fulfill the steps of humanity, he's just demonstrating it for us to do in the future, but it really doesn't apply to him. I don't believe that in its entirety. Do I think Jesus needed to repent of his sin? No. He's the sacrificial spotless lamb. But there is something more going on in this moment that I think people miss. And I think it's very profound as you begin to open the scriptures. I do not think Jesus is just demonstrating us something that says, this really applies to you. Not so this moment really isn't for me. Some people have taken it that it is nothing more than a model for us. I think there's quite a bit more. Why? Okay, first, the word fulfill. Okay, if you look in the Greek, in the original New Testament, the word fulfill means to make full or to complete often with the understanding of finishing something that has already been started. Something's already in the works by the time Jesus hits here. And this moment, something about this moment of baptism is going to bring to completion an act that was started in the past. Okay, and then the word righteousness, fulfill righteousness. That word righteousness in the original language means a state of being judicially correct. Okay, or for these purposes, like standing in correctness before God. Okay, and again, it has in the mind the focus on redemptive action. So how can I put that in one sentence that will make you understand what Jesus means by to fulfill all righteousness? It's the completion or the fulfillment of a redemptive work that was started previously and now makes us, mankind, right before God. So this moment is something crucial and something special and has everything to do with that dove that falls down, that Holy Spirit that descends down on Jesus. This is not just like the frosting on the cake. This dove moment, this Holy Spirit moment is the cake. It is the, the whole kit and caboodle. There's something profound happening here that we have to reclaim and take a hold of. Are you with me so far? Keep going. Okay. So to understand this Fulfillment of a redemptive work that's been started in the past that is now being fulfilled to put us in a right perspective before God. To understand this, you have to go to the beginning, way, way back in Genesis, to God's design for man and the subsequent fall. How were we designed? We were meant to be in the image of Almighty God. We are meant to be his children. It even talks in the scriptures about Adam being his son, okay? We were meant to reflect. He even gives us a role that is a princely role, a kingly role of having rule over God's creation for him. My children, take care of this for me. You are my princes and my princesses. That's the feeling you get in Genesis. But that gets really fractured. And as you know, things start to go really south from there, and not south in a good way, all right? But we were destined for an intimacy and closeness. Again, I, I know this is more academic, but I need to do this because I want everybody, I don't care how old you are, I don't care if, if you're Eli back there at 11, soon to be 12 in what, a couple days? Listen mm -hmm. to me. Young people, older people, listen. You were created for a certain intimacy and closeness with God that happens through the Spirit that has become fractured along the way. The Holy Spirit was meant to dwell with us and stay with us at all times. Listen, John 4, 24. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. What does that word spirit also mean in both Hebrew and Greek? Does anyone know? Wind, breath. So now go to Genesis 3, 8. And they heard the sound of the Lord God. This is right after Adam and Eve sinned, the first sin of man. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Now, God's not just strolling with his legs. Okay, what does it mean, God walking through the cool of the day? And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. So the, the presence of, the, of God is there in the garden in the cool of the day. Well, interestingly enough, in Hebrew, that word cool of the day also means in the wind of the day. It's the spirit blowing in breezes, in closeness with God. That's how we're meant to commune. Listen, all this fancy like, theological jumbo here, let's boil it all down. We were meant to walk alongside and have closeness with the Holy Spirit, with the spirit of the living God. That was our destiny. And something went very wrong. 
And Jesus is fulfilling something, restoring a redemptive act that had been started a long time ago when that Holy Spirit falls on him in his baptism. The Spirit of God was supposed to be present with man, like the I am in you, you are in me type of closeness. And Jesus is the first among brothers, right? He says he undergoes this, and he, he gives it right at this water ba baptism, something so incredible that we, we could miss. It says the Spirit descends and rests on him. Well, that word rest also is a funny word, because that also goes back to the Garden of Eden. And on the seventh day, what did, what did God do? He rested. He worked. He created. He made it. The culmination of his creation was to make us in his image. And right then, he rests with us. And the book of Hebrews says that when we receive Christ, when we receive his spirit, we find rest. Rest in the Bible means to have communion and peace and rest with God. That's our destiny. That's what we were created for. So the spirit comes and bam, all of a sudden, man and God Find rest again. Find communion again. Find union again. That's why it says in Hebrews, we enter God's rest through Christ, and now we can approach the throne of grace with confidence. Why? Because his presence is restful and peaceful for those who have been made right. Last point on this little study. I hope I didn't go over my 10 minutes, but work with me. I want to give you this background. Because in John, in the book of John, when it talks about this moment between John the Baptist and Jesus and this baptism, John phrases it a little differently. In John 1.33, it says, I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain. This is who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. This is the one who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So where am I going with this? In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit only descended briefly, temporarily, on prophets, priests, kings, and judges. It's the only record. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, when this moment, when God and man come together in Jesus Christ, we're told that that Spirit is going to rest on you and on me, and it's going to remain. Remember, it only went on prophets, priests, kings, and judges. It, it anointed them and lifted off. But on Jesus, that Spirit remains. It doesn't leave. And the same, yes, do I believe Jesus was immersed and baptized into the Holy Spirit in that moment? I absolutely do. I know there's a lot of different denominations. This is why I wanted to do this study first. A lot of different denominations. No denomination owns the term baptism of the Holy Spirit because it's a biblical term. We've been given one spirit to drink. We were all baptized into one spirit, 1 Corinthians says. And Jesus Christ but reunites that intimacy with God when the Holy Spirit comes down on him. Do you know we don't have one record of a miracle before the Holy Spirit empowers him? Not one. None. This is the first moment that we have immediately after the Spirit descends on him. Jesus starts his ministry. He starts doing miracles. Something happens. If you say, wait a minute, Ryan, are you saying, Pastor Ryan, that Jesus doesn't do any supernatural, miraculous stuff until the Holy Spirit comes? Listen to Acts 10. As for the word that was sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning with Galilee, that after the baptism, John proclaimed how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, and he went about doing good and healing. It's right there in Scripture. The Holy Spirit empowers Jesus' ministry. The Holy Spirit connects him, makes him feel that intimacy and closeness that we were destined for. And something profoundly redemptive happens at this baptism. It is not merely a demonstration of us going into the water someday. It is the redemptive work of God and man coming back together. And my point in all of this is, if Jesus had the Holy Spirit to empower, empower his ministry, you can be real sure that we do too. <laughs> Just a few quick announcements. Uh, first thing is the faith group. A lot of these Ryan has already talked about. Um, we've uh, talked about them in the past, but if you're interested in joining one um, so that you can be part of a group of people who help each other grow in their beliefs and where you can feel safe speaking your mind, see me for details. And we have two groups. Um, one meets on Monday nights and the other on Wednesday nights. Currently, we, we 
we are planning a fun thing for our Monday night group, a tubing event in July. But I know I can say I, I have joined a faith group, which are, seems to be all right here. <laughs> and, and I've become very close to them. So it's a great way to, to get to meet people in a, in a different way from our church. Um, also planning a church-wide church activity. We would like to plan a summer picnic this summer for everyone. So if anyone has any creative ideas, or places we can hold the event, let me know that. And then two current volunteer opportunities in the nursery, which Gail is back there. And we're hoping to get another volunteer so that um, hopefully we get enough volunteers so that we only have to miss a, li you know, a couple of sermons um, so that we can have the switching in and out. And also media, Tiffany back there. She could use someone to sub in for her running the slides during worship time also so that she can get a break and sit down here and not be back there all the time. So any interest in that seems to be. Thank you. <laughs> all right, everybody. Are you ready for the sermon now? Now that we're 15 <coughs> minutes into it now. 10 minutes. Are you ready? Yeah. All right, everybody stand up and take a big stretch. No, you don't. <laughs> all right, listen. I wanted, you to, I wanted you to know that because it's important. It's important that people understand that Jesus' baptism is not a mere demonstration that doesn't really apply to him. There's something profoundly redemptive where the Holy Spirit comes into Jesus' life and empowers him for ministry. All right? Now, remember when you first fell in love. How many people, if you're married here or if, you're, uh, if you think back to the first time that, I mean, you were head over heels like in love. Like, you know, the old school uh, Looney Tunes cartoons where the eyes bug out of the head and you're, whoa, and you're, just, you're just totally mesmerized by the person. I want you to think back to that and then remember what it was like when that love was returned. That closeness you felt to the other person, didn't it make you feel like you could conquer the world? When you first realized that the person you absolutely loved more than anything in the world, but you found out that that person returned that love to you. You were like, you had a walk in your step. You were like, yes, I rock, she loves me, yes. Right, if there was a Salvation Army guy you with his bucket, you'd give him an eck here, but take a couple extra bucks. She said yes, right? You're all excited, you feel like you can take on anything. All right, and up until that point, because you're waiting to find out when you first like, oh man, I really like this girl. Opal's dying over here. Right? <laughs> when I really like this girl. I really hope she likes me. And, and do you remember that dandelion game? Did anybody play the dandelion game when they were younger? I might be dating myself with the younger people, and maybe the generation above me is going, what's he talking about with the dandelion game? Yeah, you got it, Aaron knows it, right? You took the dandelion, and you'd say, she loves me, she loves me not, and you'd pick a petal off of each of it, and start to come back. All of a sudden, people are like, yeah, I got you. Was it a daisy? Oh, right. <laughs> I'm, over here. I'm over here, she loves me, she loves me not, she loves me, she loves me not. It's been about two years. Two years. <laughs> The daisy, right? She loves me. She loves me not. She loves me. She loves me not, right? You remember that, that the game we used to play? And I think, to be honest, I, I think sometimes we do that with God. Sometimes we're not so sure about his love for us. And sometimes we take the day and we're like, he loves me? Ah, I didn't have such a good week. He loves me not. You know what? I was on fire for the Lord today. I told somebody about Jesus. He loves me. Ah, man, I, I fell into some old traps, some old hang-ups and some old sins. Yeah, he loves me not. And I think sometimes we get into that dandelion or daisy, whatever. What is it? Can somebody tell me? Is it, right, from now on, if I say dandelion, will you just go, yes, keep preaching? That's right. Keep preaching, right? Sometimes we get into that game with him, and, and, and we're not really sure how he feels about us. You know, psychologists have said that a mother's love is always known. Because, right, right from the beginning, right? We come from, from the womb and immediately there's what's called a bonding moment. Everybody knows the bonding moment between the, the mother and the child and the dad is off here going, where's my bonding moment? I didn't get a bonding moment. Why did she get the bonding moment? You deserve the bonding moment, women. I'm just kidding. Mothers, I'm just teasing, okay? But there's this immediate bonding moment and, and so psychologists have kind of expounded on this. I don't know if it's true or if it's not, but people have said that a father's love is sometimes a big question mark. 
Sometimes they're, they're not sure. And so what we do is we create these bonding moments. I just had bonding moments with two of my boys. Okay, Luke, I know it's not you this time, but you've had many bonding moments with dad, okay? This one was, first one was Eli, and we went to Cape Cod on his school field trip. That was exciting. Oh, yeah. Ooh, mm -hmm. man, you get 120 uh, sixth graders, and I'm going to tell you, I was exhausted for two days, right? So we went there, and I remember thinking, I don't care what's going on. I want a bonding moment. I don't care how busy I am. I want to have a bonding moment with my son. And then I had Caleb this weekend where I thought, you know what, I just spent some time with Eli. Obviously, I've spent a lot of time with Luke. I'm taking Caleb and we're going fishing for striped bass at the mouth of the Connecticut River in Old Saybrook, where it dumps out into the ocean, where people catch striped bass left and right, and where I, for the first time, took after my father and caught nothing. <laughs> now, we had a little bite and that was it, okay? But no striped bass. But, you know, I sat there and I just watched Caleb fish after a while. I put my pole down and I just watched the fish and it was out there. And I just thought, I don't want to miss this moment. We look for bonding moments with our children, you know, because we, we want to unite. I believe in Jesus' baptism, there is this, this first bonding moment between God the Father and Jesus Christ the Son. We don't read about it anywhere else in scripture. This is prior to this. This is the first one. And I love what God says, you know. And I, again, I think we can read it so fast and immediately think to our own water baptism that we missed it. What God says, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. This is a very special, intimate moment between Jesus and God that happens through the Holy Spirit. Where, G where God looks down and, and says in an audible way, that's my boy. That's my son. Dad you used to have this thing, you used to always say, when evil can evil. Do you remember where I'm going with this? Yes. Okay? Evil can evil. How many people know evil can evil? I used to race those dirt bikes. Or the, they weren't even dirt bikes. Sometimes they were street bikes. I put it in the suspension and fall out. Okay? And jump over the cars where he had a son, Robbie can evil, who decided it was his first one on TV where he was going to take after his dad. And, and they interviewed Evil Knievel, and they said, how do you feel about your son? Do you want to do it? My son, my son, my son. That's exactly how, it was the most dramatic thing. He said, how do you feel about your son doing this? And he just goes, my son, my son, my son. Taken after his dad's footsteps. And here's this moment where Jesus is getting ready to launch on ministry, and God says, this is my son, and I am well pleased. This is a special moment. This is not just some ritual that he goes through. Well, we don't know how much of a relationship he had with his father beforehand. We know he goes to the house of worship, and he wants to connect, all right? But through the Holy Spirit, we get a new paradigm of closeness again between God and man. The reception of his father's spirit provides a new point of relationship for Jesus and his father. Last week, we had him at a boy in the temple. Temple, right? And the irony was, as his parents were looking for him, he was looking for his father. Well, here in the second words of Jesus, we find the father coming to him. And that's how it should be. If you don't know Jesus, and if you don't know the gospel, and if you don't know God, listen, that's how it works. We run to him as he's coming to us. He's looking for his father. I got to be in my father's house the very next time God comes to him. This is a special moment where he is anointed, immersed with power. From this moment, Jesus steps out in authority and in power, not just wisdom and authority, but power like he could conquer the world. Like that first moment where he must say, oh, can you just picture Jesus hearing, my son, my son, my son. And after that, he's like, let's go take out the world. Let's go right the wrongs. Let's go heal the sick. Let's go give sight to the blind. And it all comes through the Holy Spirit. And I think there's a lot of people today who are still trying to catch a glimpse of their Father's Spirit. No more. <coughs> he loves me. He loves me not. God loves me. Ooh, I did some things I shouldn't have spoke. I said some thoughts I shouldn't have had. He loves me not. He loves me. No more with that. we got to put that behind us. 
we got to, to show all that and, and have this experience where we know because the Holy Spirit fills us. If you don't know God loves you, listen, I'm going to tell you something. I can give you doctrine and dogma and theology until we're all purple. I can do little Bible studies before the sermon. I can do a little one after. There is no replacement for having the Holy Spirit come down on you, anoint you, you feel his presence, and you will know that you are his. You cannot replace that moment. I'm all for good theology and I'm all for good doctrine. I believe in that. I love the studies of scriptures. But listen to me. The world right now needs to encounter the spirit of God. And if Jesus' ministry was defined and empowered by the Holy Spirit, I promise you that without the, without the Holy Spirit, the church will be dead. We will have a lifeless ministry. Pastor Don, I know you and I talk about this. Without the Holy Spirit, we won't have that intimacy with God. We won't have that you are my son, you are my daughter, and I am well pleased with you moment. That's what people need to hear. Doctrine and theology are okay, but they're like the train tracks, right? They keep us on the straight so we don't veer off. But nobody pays a ticket for a train ride so they could sit on the tracks. You want to. You want to encounter the train. We just went up to Mount Washington. We took that, I think I told you last week, the Cod Railway up. And the whole time you're going up, I'm thinking, man, if these brakes go, we are a long way down. I didn't pay for my family just to ride rails. We wanted to ride the train. Theology's okay. It's good. Doctrine's good. But people need to encounter the train. And that comes through the Holy Spirit. That's the presence of God alive. And I think there's three things that we learn from Jesus' baptism that are critically important. And I'm going to go through them. Number one, there comes a time in our life, young people, if you're here and you, don't, and you haven't been baptized, there's a time that we say, I, am, I am, have matured in my spiritual walk. I want to profess <coughs> Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And you know what the tragedy is? Now, I've had many people say to me, Pastor Ryan, I'd love to get baptized, but I don't think I know enough. I don't think I've studied enough scripture. I don't have the rails on the train down all the way from here to the top of the mountain, so I guess I can't ride the train. Understand this, right? The baptism of Jesus at 30 years old was the start of his ministry. It's the front door to our relationship, not the tail end. It's the front, it's the steam engine, it's not the caboose in the back. It's our way of saying, that man I wanna follow in my life. That's the one I wanna learn his way, his yoke. I wanna surrender my life. That's part of fulfilling all righteousness to get to that point where we wanna proclaim that he's our Lord and Savior because Jesus says, whoever acknowledges me before men, I will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. And there is a place that I believe very strongly where we grow in maturity to come to that place where we say, I want to profess him as my Lord and Savior before everybody. Because that is the man I'm following. That is my step in fulfilling righteousness. It's not, it's not like you've reached your seminary degree and now you're ready to get baptized. It's symbolic of a coming of age, a turning point in your life where you go from longing to follow in your biological father's footsteps to longing to seek after your spiritual father and look into your spiritual brother, Jesus, to get you there. It's the beginning of the journey. It's not the end, right? I said it before. Israel was said to be baptized into the Red Sea when they came across the, when they came through there and went into the desert. It wasn't the start of their relationship and covenant. Sorry, it wasn't the end of their covenant with God. It was the start of their covenant with God. I think there's a place to reclaim baptism. But number two, this ritual, if all it is is a ritual, if all it is is I got to a certain age, so I guess I need to go in the tank. And if it's just about the water and it doesn't have the Holy Spirit alive in you, then that ritual doesn't mean much. Now, am I saying that your baptism doesn't mean, if you were baptized here, I was baptized at 14. Am I saying it doesn't matter? If the Holy Spirit didn't fall like a dove in your lap and look at you, then it doesn't matter, not at all. What I'm saying is it's meant to point to something greater. Our baptism in water is meant to point to what Jesus calls the living water. 
the Holy Spirit alive in us. That intimacy where God looks down and says, you, you are my daughter with whom I am well pleased. You are my son with whom I am well pleased. That connection point, we have to be alive in the spirit of God. That's what baptism symbolizes. The water is symbolic of the living water. The baptism, the immersion in the water is symbolic of being immersed in the spirit of God. And like Jesus, when we come to it like that, we will be alive in ministry. We will be dynamic in ministry. We have to get back to the Holy Spirit. What do we say, Pastor Don, right? We cut the Holy Spirit out of the Trinity. We focus on God the Father. We focus on Jesus the Son. But as soon as you talk about intimacy and the Holy Spirit, people check out. Listen, we were meant to walk in the wind, the cool wind of the day with the Lord. That has been our destiny. And that is what we have to reclaim. Think about it like this. The relationship between our water baptism and the baptism we get. I mean, if you could just picture John, right? John says, right, that I baptize you with water, but he, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And you know what's, what's tragic in the modern church? We focus all on the water. We forget the Spirit. John's saying, hey, mine's going to decrease. That's the one that really matters. The thief on the cross, crucified next to Jesus, was he baptized in water? No. Was he baptized into Christ and into the spirit of Christ? Yes, and he has salvation because that is the south, that is the baptism that saves us. That is the baptism that pours our heart out. That is the baptism that restores us with God. That is the baptism that makes us alive. The Holy Spirit sanctifies us, grows us, unites us to God, sets our feet on fire. We have to be passionate about the spirit of God. We have to believe that those words, you are my child, whom I am well pleased, are, are not only meant for Jesus, but they're meant for you. Think about it like this. When I got married, honey, you're here. When we got married, if I had said to you, I don't have any relationship with you, I don't know if I love you or not, until the point of the ceremony. And all of a sudden, the ceremony happened, and I said, I do, I said, that's it, I'm in love. <laughs> you would think that that was pretty shallow, right? You'd be like, what is my husband doing? I don't even know if I want this husband anymore. Can I trade up? What's happening? <laughs> baptism. Our water baptism. Baptism. We, it's meant to testify to a baptism that's already happened in us through Jesus Christ. It's our immersion that speaks to the immersion that's already happened in here, where we've been washed clean by the Spirit of God. My relationship with God, with Jesus, and with the Holy Spirit has already happened. And now I'm going to tell everybody about not what I'm doing, not what the priest is doing, not what the clergy is doing, not what the pastor is doing, but what God has already done in me. I'm not dismissing the ceremony any more than I'm dismissing my ceremony of marriage with my wife. She wouldn't be happy if I did that. But it's always meant to point to something greater. And I think we have to reclaim it. We have to be alive because this is point three I think we get from Jesus' baptism, right? Point three, this closeness that we have through the Spirit pleases Almighty God. Hear the words again. <clears throat> this is my son, my son, my son, my son, with whom I am well pleased. <clears throat> Do you know that God desires in being united. Jesus' baptism isn't some mere ritual to make us do the ritual in the church. It's the fulfillment of something that was fractured a long, long time ago that God has been longing and is pleased to unite us to him again. That's what baptism is. That's what matters. This moment in scripture doesn't just tell us who Jesus is, it tells us who we are, as those who are gonna receive the same baptism into the same spirit, into our Sabbath rest where we can commune and feel the cool breeze of the day again that has been taken from us. It pleases God to bond with us. Just like I said, I don't wanna miss this moment with my son fishing. I don't wanna miss this moment with my son in Cape Cod. Don't go through church life so bent on rituals and oh, it's time for me to do this. 
that we miss the bonding moment because that's what Jesus' baptism was. It was a bonding moment between father and son. And I'm going to tell you, I told you, I'm going to try to do, as I close, I'm going to try to do three things, a couple things in this series. One is to say who Jesus is by his words, say who we are by his words, and how it speaks prophetically to the world. I believe, brothers and sisters, this intimacy with God this closeness in the spirit is exactly what people need. Let me close with this illustration. Go back to my son. Oh. If I said to them, listen, now look, I, I'm going to get in hot water here. I love the scriptures. I do. We study the scriptures. Mm -hmm. My father and I had bonding moments talking about the scriptures since I was this high. Dad, what does it mean when Jesus says this? Dad, what, I drove him nuts, didn't I? I I love the scriptures. So don't take this the wrong way. But I think in this moment where Jesus says very little, but the spirit comes down and there's that my son and my father moment. I think that's the key to winning the world for Christ. I really do. They're not going to accept our scriptures just because we give it to them. We're not going to say, well, how do I know it's true? How do I know I'm saying, well, it said it in this book. Yeah, but I don't know if I believe that book. they got to feel it. Something has to have to be there. Or they're not going to. They're not going to go with it. I'm telling you. They're going to say, yeah, that book says this, and this book says that, and that book says this. So what? they got to hear, my son, my son, my son. I want you to picture it. It's the best way I could explain it. Imagine if I wrote a letter to Caleb. And I said, Caleb, this is Dad. I have a covenant with you, so I want you to know I love you unconditionally. I'm paraphrasing. And maybe I've added some other stuff, told him about how I felt, and I gave him the letter. And he could read and say, oh, my dad has, has this covenant of love with me. It's unconditional love. I'm going to be with him. All this stuff sounds great. But in the meantime, all his friends were playing catch with their dads, throwing the football. Fishing. I didn't pay him no mind. All he had was my letter. Do you think he would feel love? No. I'm going to say it the most blunt way I can. If all we're given people that don't know God is the letter and taken out any encounter or experience, they're going to feel like children who got a letter, not children who played with their father. I love this book. I am not knocking it. Please don't think that. I'm telling you, what's going to win the people out there is when the Holy Spirit fills them from the inside. They encounter it and they fall on their knees and they hear this. My son, my son, my son, my daughter, my daughter, my daughter. I am pleased with you. <clears throat> That's going to empower them. That's going to make them say, take an extra dollar in the Salvation Army bucket. A Salvation Army bucket. God said yes. That's when they're going to feel alive. That's when they're going to be moved. That's when it's going to matter. That's when they're going to go to that book and find life out of it. When they to hear that the Holy Spirit remains on them. Listen, if you're looking online, if you're listening online, the Holy Spirit doesn't just drop down, say hello, and leave anymore. Jesus did something redemptive. He turned something around. Now the Holy Spirit remains in us. When we're sick, he remains. When we're broken, he remains. When our childs are unhealthy, he remains. When we have loss and grief, when loved ones pass away, he's right there, he remains. When we sin, he's right there and he remains. When we mess up, when our relationships are busted, he remains. The Holy Spirit descends and remains on us just like he did with Jesus. That will make all the difference in the world. Amen? Amen. Amen. Loving God, we, we, I pray that someone would submit and open their hearts to you today, maybe tomorrow. I'm asking the Holy Spirit that you work in someone's heart today. 
and that they will progress spiritually. We know that the beginning of our walk starts like a, like a sunrise, <coughs> but then it progresses to the sunset. And so, Lord God, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would work within us, mold us, and shape us just as a potter shapes the clay. I pray for a miracle today to happen in the heart of someone here. They may not know what to do after, to, after this service, but I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would work on someone's heart. Lord, we know that the church without the Holy Spirit is like a sailboat without any wind. It just will flounder. It will go nowhere. So we pray for empowerment by your spirit. And we know that the end result will, will be spirit of God. We know that you want to make us Christ-like. We want to follow our master. Oh, Lord, work in the heart of someone today. Let this time be redemptive. Let this time touch someone's heart today. We pray for nothing less than a miracle.